All right, I was able to uh, get the uh, bottom part right here up on top of this uh, leg of the uh, cherry picker and then shorten up, get my little short piece of chain on there and raise it up and now it's fairly mobile. But um, I think I'm gonna add, actually transfer it right, right from this area here. I get a little bit of area to work with here. So my plan is I've got a uh, engine stand for uh, working on uh, you know uh, regular motors, and I'm hoping that I can actually figure a way to adapt the uh, the part that actually hooks onto the transom to hook onto the plate that's on the engine stand and use that engine stand to uh, support the motor while I'm working on it down here. And I don't know if that's going to even work, but I figure the best way to figure it out would be to get the thing vertical and see if we can't get some stuff to line up. Just wondering about the, uh, the way the load's going to be trained. Yeah, that should still work. As long as I keep that top heavy load out in front of the uh, stand where it's going to be over the legs of the stand, that should work. So, um, let's see. So I guess I want to get this thing vertical next. And I'm thinking that as it lifts, if I can kind of keep some tension on this bottom here, I might be able to uh, avoid the problem that I was worried about, which is the uh, uh, putting too much force on this casting on the bottom here. Also not positive how much lift I'm going to get out of this thing. Now, I should be able to get this thing vertical, even with that chain lengthened a little bit than it is. Although actually now, if I put something underneath this, lower it back down, I can take that slack right out of the chain. I'm going to do that. I gotta get something underneath. Oh, well, memory card's filling up again. I'm behind on my editing, so the hard drive on the computer is full, thumb drive's full, I don't have a place to put all this data. Well, okay, phase one, got the uh, thing vertical. All right, so I haven't uh, mounted this on the motor uh, stand yet for service, but I just kind of wanted to kind of give a quick overview of some of the things that I'm seeing on here and just call out some of the major components for those of you who aren't familiar with these Mercury outboards. Um, I'm actually not familiar with Mercury's in particular, but uh, I've worked on a few of these outboards and uh, just uh, have been able to piece together enough information to figure out some things. Um, so the major issue on uh, this right off the bat is the, uh, the deterioration of all of the insulation. You see how this is just crumbling and coming off? Well, what you're looking at underneath there is the bare copper wire, and it's actually corroded because water's been getting in there, infiltrating. This is, needless to say, very bad. Um, you've got bare copper conductors in close proximity to each other. If anybody actually tried to put power to this with the wiring in this condition, I would be very surprised if they didn't see sparks or smoke, or at the very least blowing some fuses and that kind of thing. So we got some wiring issues here, and it looks to me like they started out with maybe some initial wiring uh, issues that they decided to try and rectify, because these yellow wires right here with these crimp connectors right here, um, and then these crimp connectors down here that spliced to the old wiring, this is newer, and what we've got here is this terminal block right here is where the uh, disconnect is made from this wiring harness, which is actually part of the uh, the uh, stator or the alternator underneath the flywheel. Okay, 
So this wiring harness right here actually goes up and become and is an integral part of the, the that component. So unfortunately, you can see it's in bad shape. Also, same problem. It's got dry rot and corrosion. I'm hoping that I'll be able to cut that back even further underneath the sheathing somewhere and splice in new wiring for that. Um, for those of you who don't know what what the purpose of this is, this is basically this acts as an alternator. When the engine is running, this coil will generate AC voltage, and then the AC voltage will then be rectified by a component called a rectifier, which will turn it into DC voltage, and it's used to run the, elect the electrical system while the motor is running, and it's also used to charge the battery and keep a charge on the battery while the motor is running so that the next time you go to start the engine your battery's not dead so uh, that's basically what what the purpose of that is uh, if we look down here the main wiring harness comes in here and uh, it was taped up the tape's been cut away or fell off and you can see the wiring in there this is really bad uh, this is toast Okay, and then up here, again, this is all toast. This device right here is the rectifier. Uh, this block right here is the rectifier. So you can see that there are three connections on the rectifier. There is a yellow one, a red one, and a yellow one. The ground is actually the case, this motor casing. So this being bolted to this case is actually the ground connection. These two yellow ones are going to be the AC input. So these two yellow wires more than likely, uh, these two connect wires on these two yellow connections more than likely are going to go right over to these two wires right here. All right? And then that leaves the center one with the red, and we know from our basic electricity that we like to, we like to call the red the positive and the black the negative. So that's your, your, your positive voltage out right here. Okay? This box right above it is uh, this box right above it is affectionately referred to by Mercury as the switch box, which is uh, <laughs> kind of funny that they call that a switch box because uh, it sounds uh, pretty innocuous, but. Uh, you know, the switch box makes it sound like there might actually be like relays or switches inside there or contacts. And no, this is an electronic module. This is an electronic ignition module. Um, not, uh, not unlike in operation, not very unlike that nightmare um, igniter uh, box that they used on the uh, OMCs for a while there. Similar situation, electronic circuitry, this is all potted. So in other words, uh, there's a PC board in here inside this case and then they fill this whole case with this potting material. So pretty much making it uh, uh, unserviceable. So why am I talking about this so much? Well, I'll tell you why. Because this is a very expensive unit to replace. It's, I believe, obsolete from Mercury, and so you have to go with like an aftermarket, like Quicksilver or one of those companies that makes an aftermarket replacement for this. And the aftermarket replacement, I believe, is somewhere in the vicinity of $400. You can occasionally find a used one on eBay and you roll the dice and take your chances there. And I think you can get a used one for 50 to 150 bucks seems to be what they tend to be running. Uh, and you gotta be careful because you also need, uh, there are quite a few versions of these and I'm, I'm sure that some of them might be interchangeable, but I bet you some of them are absolutely not interchangeable at all. So um, this is a, this right here, if this is bad, on a motor this age, it will probably be a non-starter. Haha, <laughs> pardon the pun. What I meant to say, I, as in, like, not worth it for me to pursue it. This cup-shaped bracket right here, and this big 
hole right here, this opening that has nothing in it, right here. What goes here is the starter. The starter has been cannibalized out of this motor before I bought it. I already picked up a new old stock replacement Sierra starter for this thing. I think Sierra, yeah, Sierra might be the company that makes the aftermarket uh, electronic uh, ignition too. But anyways, um, so I picked up a, a starter because I figured, well, you know, at some point I was going to get this going. Um, reality is I probably should have even held off on buying that because um, I can bench test this electronic ignition module, this switch box. I can bench test this and the coil without even turning the engine over. And I'm going to show how to do that. And the reason why I want to do that is, again, um, the motor turns over, so it's not frozen. I didn't hear anything really bad when I turned it over slowly, so I don't think we've got a broken connecting rod or anything like that. But you always got to be you know, wary about something like this. Now, here's something else that I just noticed that I haven't noticed previously. All right, get a load of that, guys. I don't like that at all. We got a bolt right here that's partially out. As a matter of fact, that's so loose, I can unscrew it with my fingers. Why is that bolt halfway out? That bolt is one of what looks to be nine bolts that hold this access cover on this this i believe this is an inspection cover if i'm not mistaken so i think when you take that cover off you can look right into the cylinder and look right at the pistons i might be wrong on that and we might end up picking a peek later and finding out but uh i, I don't like that that shouldn't be that shouldn't be loose that makes me think somebody's been in there so, you know, I could put the starter in this thing, uh, temporarily wire it up to get it to turn over and do a compression test. That's probably a, a good starting point right there. Pardon the pun as far as, uh, you know, assessment, initial assessment of this thing. I don't want to go through the trouble of doing all this major, you know, reconstruction of this wiring harness only to find out that this thing's got a broken connecting rod or a piston with a hole through the top of it or something ridiculously catastrophic with it uh here's the uh, starter solenoid right here don't know if that's any good or not but the wiring going to that is toast um this little uh slice of heaven right here this is the uh unique ignition coil that uh they use on this thing um again not entirely that different than the setup of the oh of the uh, Johnson, the old Johnson uh, outboard that I was working on with the uh, OMC igniter in it, similar principle where they're using a specially designed ignition coil. So uh, they're relying on a pretty hefty pulse coming out of this electronic module to fire that uh, that coil to make your your spark. So, and then what triggers this box to send that pulse out? Well, right over here, lo and behold, what do we have? We have a distributor. There's your distributor cap, and there's your distributor. And uh, that's pretty funky. And what they're doing is they're running the distributor off of this pulley, which has a belt that runs over to a pulley underneath the flywheel here. And of course, how would that stay in time? Well, it's a toothed belt. So it's it's a timing belt. It's, it's like a miniature version of a uh, timing belt on a modern automobile. And uh, this has also got the uh, unique feature where the actual entire body of the um, distributor can be rotated depending on the setting of the throttle linkage. So they're actually they're actually changing the timing of the uh, spark 
depending on the RPMs. So that's kind of cool. Um, so what's happening inside here? Well, there's actually two things that are happening inside this distributor. One of the things that's happening is these wires right here go into a device uh, called the trigger. And the trigger on these is a uh, known device that can fail and doesn't necessarily mean the thing won't run. You can have a bad trigger that will cause the engine to run, but just run very poorly. So unfortunately, uh, that can be a little tricky to diagnose, but the biggest problem is the trigger is not a serviceable part. So this little semiconductor or solid state device or Hall effect sensor, I'm not exactly sure exactly what they're using in there, but this little stupid component which is not that expensive at all when it decides to fail is going to cost you big money because you have to buy the entire distributor assembly and again this is one of those things that's a very expensive item now I'll tell you right now if this has a bad trigger I am NOT going to shell out the money for a new distributor for it however I did find after scouring the internet because I just knew that if you could get this thing apart I just had a feeling there might be something you could do about that and you know if we have to get to that point we might might tear this thing down but I found a guy who actually was taking one of these things apart down to that level and uh, I have no idea where he got another trigger from uh, but he literally took the distributor apart and kind of rebuilt it. And it's the only guy I've ever seen do that. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to find that video again. Oh, and, and uh, as if it wasn't enough of a hoot that it, you know it was hard to find the video in the first place, the guy doesn't speak English at all. So it's basically you just have to watch him do it to see how that comes apart. Because a, a lot of the other guys were like, oh, no, you can't take it apart. You can't take it apart. You can't service it. But So if we have to, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But... So that's that's part one of what's going on here is that um, as the uh, as this rotates, it goes by a little sensor, and I'm not sure if it's like a Hall effect sensor. Where there's a little magnet that goes by it, or exactly what's going on in there. But there's a little sensor in there, and every time this goes around, that sensor sends a little tiny pulse out to the uh, switch box over there, and then that switch box does its magic and uh, generates the big pulse that goes into the primary of the ignition coil and then the ignition coil sends the very big pulse the high voltage out through this wire and then sends it back to the distributor and then the distributor does the job which actually gave it its name it distributes the high voltage to one of the six spark plugs depending on what position the rotor which is the part that's underneath the distributor cap here is in so if it's like so this 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 center cable in the distributor is feeding that uh, rotor and then the rotor just kind of goes around and when it's close to this one and it fires it's going to make that spark jump to this contact in here and then come down this wire and go to that spark plug so that's why it's basically going to keep going around and around and around and around but depending on which order you have these outside ring of wires plugged in that's going to determine your firing order and obviously you got to make sure your firing order is correct otherwise you're going to have a whole world of hurt you're either going to have an engine that won't run or you're going to have an engine that will run very poorly because maybe two of the four cylinders are swapped or something stupid like that. So, that's that. And then uh, there's, uh, there's some outer covers that have already been removed off this engine by the previous person who was monkeying with it. So, that saved me a little bit of time there. Um, but it's interesting because... One of the nightmares on this motor that people talk about is they talk about, I believe that this is the number one cylinder at the top here, they talk about number six, 
Look at number six. Number six is down here inside this cowling. You can't even get a conventional spark plug socket on there with a ratchet, but you can get a regular wrench on there and get that, that spark plug out. But even that's tough to do or impossible to do really when this actual outer cover is in, in place. So very, you know, bare minimum, you've got to get this outer cover off and it can get a little bit involved to, to get into this motor. And the other thing that's going to be fun is um, trying to get my compression tester in there. Uh, I've got one with a hose on it and I'm hoping that I've got maybe a connector that will thread in there and allow me to make a right angle turn because I don't know how else I'm going to do that. Two, three, four, five, and six are going to be easy, but not that sucker. That's going to be a tough one. These spark plugs don't look that old, so I don't know. Don't know what we're going to find, but uh, if the starters, I figure I'll take that module out. 